A man who stands for nothing will fall, will fall for anything. Malcolm X. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us to uh, joining us tonight for the fourth talk of the Tehran Summit. My name is Erfan Riyasi. I'm an artist and a researcher based in Tehran and one of the curators of the Tehran Summit. The Tehran Summit creates an alternative way of looking at the process of art making and rejects the monopolization of art by art institutions. The Tehran Summit is a bridge between Iran's art community and artists around the world and brings together different contemporary discourses and methods of art making utilized by contemporary artists. The Tehran Summit emerged emerges out of a need for independent and artist-run events initiated by independent art, art practitioners in a climate heavily affected by art institutions and commercial galleries. In addition, the Terran Summit runs on zero budget, it is an accelerationist and a speculative idea to signify that even living under the condition of capitalist realism and a hierarchical atmosphere created by art institutions, there are still uncountable possibilities. Thanks so much. Okay. Hello, Per Putner. Thanks for being with us from um, Paris. I'm Gazelle. Gazelle in Iran. Gazelle in the world. Anyway, I have to say that. <laughs> okay, Per Putner was born in 1967 in Sweden. I can barely pronounce the name of the city you were born in. Oskar Sham. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> he lives and works in Stockholm and Paris. He was trained at Kunst, okay, Kunst Hoger Skolan in Stockholm. You lost your razon. NSA didn't like that one. Yeah, see, she jinxed it. Yeah. Guess how. Welcome collection in London. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, can you start from the beginning? You can After, you yeah. hear me? No, yeah, we lost you. Can you start from the Constell? From the uh, <laughs> education. We got the education. So yeah. after education. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> he has shown his work extensively in Europe, Australia, Asia, North and South America. Solo exhibitions and major presentations include. Zenday Contemporary in Shanghai, Gothenburg's Art Museum in Sweden, Welcome Collection in London. Participation in group shows include Museo de Arte Moderna de São Paulo in Brazil, Palais de Tokyo in Paris, the Hayward Gallery in London, Moderna Museet in um, Stockholm, MACBA in Barcelona. He has performed at Tate Britain, Tate Modern, Pinacoteca, Museo Jumex, and the Venice Biennial. He has represented at art museums in Sweden, Poland, China, and Brazil. Per Hudner is the founder and the director of the International Research Network Vision Forum and a member of the Performance Collective One Plus One is Three, where he has been part of developing the EEG synth, a tool to use brain activity in performative art. Thank you, Per, for being here. So thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and um, really look forward to um, talking to you guys. Um, the only thing that I <clears throat> guess was, was missing from the uh, introduction is that I mostly work with performance. Um, and I've been doing that, you can say that pretty much my whole career, even though in the beginning it was more uh, focused on exhibitions and, and on objects. Um, and I'll talk for about uh, 25 minutes. And the talk um, and the demonstration, I'm going to demonstrate the EEG synth. That's why I, I have this stupid outfit. It's not a fashion statement. It, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a necessity to be able to uh, walk you through uh, this talk. So the talk is kind of in, in two halves. The first half, I will introduce the, the EEG synth. And in the second half, I will talk uh, a little bit about my artistic practice. And I'm trying to keep it short because I think it's nicer to have a, a conversation. So um, 
please uh, take notes and um, if there are questions that arise. You can also uh, stop me at any time and ask me questions. Uh, I have a tendency, I'm better at complex things than, than I am with simple things. So sometimes I do get lost and because I think it's simple because I've done it for 25 years, which is not necessarily the case for you guys. So please tell me when I'm being an arrogant bugger because I, I can take it, all right? Um, <clears throat> so I start with a very short demonstration of the EEG, EEG SYN. And it's a, it's a technology platform whereby we can make performances with our own brain uh, activity. Of course, everything that we do, we do with our brains. But this is a little bit different because we, I measure my brain activity through my, through my skull and through my scalp. And it goes into this machine, which is then sent into my computer and in my computer, I will show you, um, it's because the signal is digitized, we can influence uh, sound, uh, light, moving images, basically anything which is digital, we can, we can use to influence it. Um, and today I will only work with sound, which is also what we've used it uh, for mostly. And I'm part of, a, of, of this collective, which is called one plus one equals three and together. So there are artists, musicians, and neuroscientists. And together we've developed this, this platform since 2014. So it's, we're coming up, it's almost a decade that we've looked this stupid with headbands and stuff stuck to, to our heads. Um, and like I said, after that, I will talk a little bit about my uh, artistic practice. And personally, um, in the 35 years that I've been doing this, I've never felt that art is more important than it is today. And uh, the reason, of course, is multiple, but um, I think that Vaclav Havel, the, uh, I guess he was Czech or or Czechoslovak, I can't even remember, but he was a writer and then he became the president of the country, whichever it was, or maybe it was both. I can't remember when they changed their names. Um, and he talks about parallel structures and art is uh, the, uh, probably the best, the best example of a parallel structure because it functions um, together with or in parallel with the kind of mainstream of our everyday life. And it does so a little bit differently. And uh, Havel uses the word truth. And throughout my whole life and my whole career, I've kind of veered away from using the word truth because it is, as you will hear in my talk, is a very complicated term. But I, I feel more and more that we, we will have to use it now. We have to talk about truth because um, there's so much uh, disingenuous uh, rhetoric which is used on an everyday level in order for um, a very, very small part of the world to grab even more power and even more money and even more influence. And, God knows why they want more because they already have virtually everything. So that's a question that we can discuss a little bit later. So now let's go back to the EEG sim. Um, so what, I'm, what, what we're doing is that we're, do, we're using EEG and EEG is short for electroencephalogram, which means electro, which is electro, and so fellow, which is brain in Greek, I do believe, and uh, gram, which is writing. So it's basically writing the activity of the brain. Um, and it's a non-invasive um, uh, technology, which means that it's on the outside rather than sort of having to put uh, electrodes directly into the brain. And I'm obviously very happy for that. And so you can see, I'm measuring between here and here. 
And so we're measuring quite a large chunk of my brain. And the brain, when we talk about the brain, we, we, try, we tend to kind of think about the brain's higher functions. So uh, logic, problem solving, language, um, and abstract thinking and things like that. But the brain obviously does uh, a lot more than that. It, um, we use it for all our sensory perceptions. Um, we, uh, it controls the, the breathing and the heart rate. Um, it controls all the muscles. Um, and so if I do this, it's the brain that controls it. But you also see what happens when the brain can't fully uh, control it. <clears throat> when you see a person who has uh, um, Parkinson, for instance. So when we measure this, we don't, it's a very small part that we measure, which is uh, sort of the higher function. So the first interpretation that most people have is okay if i think about a yellow dog will it make a completely different sound from if i think about uh, a moving car and it can but that's not exactly how it works and i'll try to talk you through that all right so i'm going to now uh share my screen um and what you see here now is this here, this gray bit here is my brain. And it picks up, so you said these things that you see now is because I let go of the computer. So the computer has a lot more um, energy in it than my brain has. That hopefully doesn't mean that it's more intelligent than I am. It's just more electricity. Um, but also, if I do this, you will see that it you get a very clear. So basically, any movement will appear a lot, as you can see. So it's important to sit still and not to touch things. So actually, doing this is 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 uh, is uh, is not the ideal consequences. But you you will you will you'll get the the idea. So this is in real time my brain. And this is also in real time. The gray line is my brain. The other here is just um, noise. And the brain functions in different um, bandwidths. So you can see it here. It takes this, this signal and it divides it into different uh, spectra. And what we're interested in is mostly this one, which is called alpha, because alpha can be controlled and you can see um, how relaxed I am by looking at the alpha waves. So for instance, I, the other week I had a guy here who um, has been meditating all his life and who does a, a, a lot of meditation and his alpha was something incredible. I've never ever seen anything like it. It was really, really beautiful. And these are slower waves. So I've done a project where I make uh, performances for sleeping audiences, and then they wear the EEG when they sleep. And then this delta is a lot more important, the slower waves. And that means that it can travel further in your body. Um, uh, and nobody really knows what sleep is or what the brain does uh when we sleep but one thing is for sure and that is that it does a lot so it's not like we're turning off an engine or anything like that the, the brain produces a lot of information while we sleep and not only dreams so. all right so this bit is is used uh it's you can see it's called open bci and it's used in hospitals around the world um, for checking for epilepsy, for instance, and things like that. So it's a purely medical application. Then we have a second uh, software. So the information from this open BCI is set, sent into this, which is, is a special program, which is made in Super Collider. If you have questions about Super Collider, I can guarantee you that I can't answer them because I only know how to use this, which uh, a musician and a 
technology expert called Ludwig L. Blaus has made for us. And there are certain things. So here, for instance, I can choose between which uh, wave to use. And as you see, we mostly use alpha. Here we use gamma. But we can also, um, like this one is now inverted and now it's regular. And I'll show you a little bit what it does. We can also, for instance, slow it down. So this is the incoming wave on this side. And this, the red one is the outgoing. So if I change this from 0.75 to 0.99, you'll see that it moves still uh, with the incoming signal, but a lot slower. And I will show you eventually why things like that are important. But this is a... Um, is a program that has been created just to use this medical information to, to make interesting art with. And here also now, because I'm making music, we're working with MIDI CC, but you can see we can also have MIDI notes, we can have CV, and we can have uh, gate and OSC. And so OSC is the one that we use um, if we want to control images, for instance. And then we're ready to uh, make some sounds and we can use any, pretty much any digital instrument. Um, and I, I like Ableton Live, uh, don't ask me why, but I like using this. And <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to make a little bit of sounds. And so this one, It clips a little bit, so the clipping is not supposed to be here. But what happens is is this. I'm going to open here and see. So basically what is happening here is controlling this. So it's controlling the pitch of the sound. But as you can hear, it's, it's not very beautiful and it's not very interesting. It's just quite annoying. So I suggest we look for another way of using the sound. So let's go to this one, for instance. And you can see here, it's the same thing. It's, it's based, I don't know if you hear that, but it's moving from left to right. So it's my brain that's controlling it. And I can add another one up here, for instance. And here, you see this movement here. I don't know if you can hear it because the sound is so bad. But number three here is controlled by my brain. And this here sound is also controlled by my brain. So if I hit this button, it's very annoying. Uh, but if I hit this button here where it says MIDI, anything which is um, purple here, I can control with my brain. And then of course I can choose whatever sound I want so I can add drums and I can add more more sound and the interesting thing is that the more um, the more relaxed I am, um, the more uh, dynamic the signal will be. So the more um, I relax, uh, the less you will hear of the noise in my brain and the more you will hear of the actual alpha wave. So I'll just take a minute and 
I'll, I'll put up the open BCI so you can see what happens in my brain and we can, you can just hear, see if you can hear what the brain does to the sound. And then I'll, it's more effective when I close my eyes. I'm just gonna close my eyes and see if I can get the alpha up. And of course I won't see it. So you have to report back and see if I'm any good at this. So it's this one you should pay attention to. So the CPU uh, doesn't doesn't really like um, the having Zoom and all these uh, four. Uh, programs running at the same time. So it's a lit, that's why you get the, the clipping sound. But the, the, the interesting, the thing with, the thing with neuroscience is that, um, I can maybe stop sharing the screen. Um, the interesting thing with neuroscience is that it's, it's evolved uh, a lot incredibly uh it's moved forward uh, so much um i would say particularly in the last 40 years or so so the digital revolution or whatever we call it has really been very very good for neuroscience but still um what they know or what we know about uh the brain is it's not even the tip of, of the iceberg so we know incredibly little about the brain, although we know an, an awful lot. And this is, this is important for me because it means that one of the reasons that I'm interested in this is, is because when you deal with the brain and when you deal with neuroscience, you're always very intimately dealing with the unknown. And what I'm, what I'm is that a question or? Um, and so one of the things that I, because I need to relax, I need to kind of go into a meditative, meditative state when I make music with this, it's also a way for me to go inside and to discover my, myself. Um, and I will return to that a little bit later in the talk, but it's, it's a lot about, uh, it's incredibly important, this, this, the, the question of the the unknown and when we're when we're talking about the relationship between the 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 in inside world and the outside world and now i'm kind of leaving the eg synth a little bit behind and moving more um, into the sort of my, my general talk about art. So <clears throat> when, we, when we look into the relationship between what's happening inside of me, which is a lot to do with my nervous system, but it also has a lot to do with hormones and, and all the other millions of processes that happen inside our bodies the whole time, both when we're awake and when we're asleep. Um, and they are, of course, in, in a, in a non-stop dialogue with what is happening around us. Um, and, and so to make quite a sort of a banal example, we all know what it's like when we wake up in the morning and we're in a wonderful mood and we smile towards the, uh, the world. And, and when we do that, when we're kind of, you know, when we're 
friendly and, and, and happy towards people around us, they tend to respond to us better. And the opposite is obviously also um, true when we wake up in the morning and we've overslept and we, we use the F word, which uh, Kendall talked about a lot <clears throat> yesterday. We might even have it tattooed across our face when we wake up. I don't know what that feels like. We have to ask Kendall. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> but when we do that, we tend to kind of scream at the people that we love, and then they tend to scream back at us for reasons that I still haven't figured out. And then the day can often have this be this kind of um, downward, downward spiral. And what is important when we talk about this sort of uh, emergent relationship about the outside world and the inside world is that we, we have a tendency of sort of saying, well, I don't understand you know, the other party or I don't understand why people do this, or I don't understand why they've taken this decision. Um, but I would like to mention the, um, the Caribbean poet, Edouard Glissant, who he said that he really, really wanted to like broccoli because all his friends really liked broccoli and he liked the shape and he liked the color. And he also knew that it was really good for his body. It was full of an important nutrition. But every time that he tried to taste broccoli, it, his, his body kind of said no. He found it disgusting. And he used that as a, as a kind of metaphor to say that, well, you know, there are unknowns on the outside, but there are also unknowns on the inside. There are things inside of us that we don't understand. And, and that has always, as an artist and as a human being, has always been very important for me is to, to kind of surprise myself and also to look inside myself and, and to look at the, the aspects of myself that are not necessarily becoming or intelligent or what have you not. Um, and since I have the great misfortune of liking broccoli, I need to find other ways of, uh, uh, or find other things uh, like the EEG sense to, to discover my internal, in the life that happens inside of me. And the example that I gave you before is relatively easy. It's like you smile, people smile back at you, um, you scream at people, they scream back at you. Um, but when it comes to ontological questions, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, and what do I mean? Well, for me, because as you probably figured out uh, already, I'm working with art and I'm working with science at the same time. So I have to try and kind of, I will never be a scientist. Um, I will never fully understand science, but I, I, I have to meddle with it. And one of the things that I find, and I've always find all my life, I've always find really, really strange, is why is science based on mathematics? Why, why mathematics? And scientists tend to kind of frown at me when I ask that question and they say, well, you know, it's completely abstract. There are no connections to the world. There's no anthropocentric aspects to it. And I, I can't prove it, but uh, other people can who are really intelligent. Um, but the problem is that there, there are always, in our culture, in our being, there are always things that we take for granted, things that are so fundamental to our values that we cannot really question them. And mathematics and science is one of them. And if you're interested in this, there's, there, was, there was a brilliant Austrian um, philosopher of science uh, called uh, Paul Feyerabend, who's written, he both, basically his whole career, he, he wrote about this. And he, he asks wonderful, wonderful questions about science. Um, and he was a real sort of anarchic, uh, but still uh, a beautiful mind. I really, really recommend his books if you're interested. <coughs> if you want something from a slightly more humanistic point of view, there's a guy called Amos Funkenstein or Amos Funkenstein um, who, who wrote on 
the relationship between mathematics, ontology, and religion. And he's also brilliant. He's so brilliant that it's sometimes hard to understand what the fuck he's on about. But um, it's a nice challenge. Um, and so I'm, I'm bringing up these, these the, the relationships. So if we say, okay, mathematics uh, can work because it's completely abstract, then we can build uh, an objective science. If I do believe that whenever I meet the world, it will have implications. And this is of course, really, really important for, um, for art. And I will stay with science a few more minutes, but then I promise I will leave science behind for good and I will only talk about art. Um, and one of the things that science says is that it will not deal with questions that cannot be answered. Um, uh, Paul Feyerabend, he also questions that, if, um, if since he puts everything into question. Um, but it says, if it can't be, science says, if it can't be disproven, we won't deal with it. So for instance, the question is about God, because we can't prove or disprove the existence of God, science will not deal with it. Now, does that mean that art should uh, deal with the rest? The questions that uh, doesn't have an answer? Does it mean that we should think about the existence of God uh, what was I or what were you before you were born? What will I become after I die? Um, and so on and so forth. Questions that, that exist and that we will never ever know the, the, the answer to. Um, and so basically what I'm suggesting is that an important uh, What's, what's a good word, not responsibility or task, but uh, an important part of art is to deal with cosmological metaphysical questions. And if so, if we do so, there's also the question of quality or because we are not necessarily into mathematics like uh, sciences. So we want to sort of look more at quality than we look at quantity. And how then do we define quality in relationship to things that don't have an answer? Um, and my, my theory is that if we look at it from a slightly different angle and we see um, two people who see the same film, for instance, and one of them says, oh, this made me so happy, this film, it was wonderful. And the other person says, I agree, it was wonderful, but it made me so depressed. Who is right? Well, I mean, they're both right. And I, and I guess that this is, this is the, this is my, this is the way that I look at, look at the question of quality and art is, um, just because we talk about quality doesn't mean that it's that it has to be measured. The the role of art criticism is not defining whether this exhibition, this artwork, is good or bad because that's beside the fucking point. Sorry, I'm cursing, but Kendall said I it could curse because nobody cares anymore, so I will curse. Um, but the the problem is more what does it do for us? How does it sort of affect? What kind of a effect does the artwork have on us and it can be emotional it can be rational it can be um, whatever we can come up with however it affects us and again like Kendall says said yesterday I mean it can change over time it doesn't mean that it's the same I mean my relationship to artwork that I did 30 25 30 years ago is completely different today than it was back then when I made it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I think that they're crap. It's just that I've moved on and, and things have popped up again and I've changed my perspective on them. And we, we as art makers don't have a bigger authority on what an artwork means or what it transmits or whatever term you might use than anyone who sees it. And this is one of the wonderful things with art is that we can totally disagree and that's fine. 
science has a problem when 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 people disagree but it can still be fruitful if you look like at quantum mechanics for instance and and the theory of relativity which can't work at the same time this not functioning has been incredibly um good for humanity or productive at least because all the digital technology that we use is based on quantum mechanics so without that we wouldn't be looking at each other in different places of the world um and this has always been this this has kind of always influenced my my way of making art and thinking about art because what i want to do is i want to try and rather than doing things that the art world or that the art community acknowledges and sees oh this is art this is good art this is bad art i want to do things where they're completely sort of what the fuck is this you know i want to challenge people i want to find new ways of making art i want to find new places to show art i want to find new ways of interacting with my audiences i think that the audiences should be challenged they should be forced to think and they could should be able to be upset or to be happy or to be angry or whatever it is that they should be but i as an artist i feel that this is my responsibility to challenge people in whatever way i can and um now i lost my train of thoughts here um yeah the reason the reason why i do this and and why it's important to me is because i've met so much art that has forced me to do that and that's how i kind of define art that's why i, I like art i can see paintings from the, from the 17th century or i can read philosophers from you know a few like 800 bc and i i can feel them i can but i can also be challenged by them they can really say say things or make images or whatever it is that they do that kind of makes me feel like really is that it and i guess that by making art i i kind of want to give back not the same experience but a similar experience to my audience and that is what drives me as an artist i want i want to challenge people in a similar way that i've been 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 um challenged and that's also where i agree with kendall again i see that this is far longer than 25 minutes but i do and i do apologize as i do i'm finishing now um <clears throat> um and that's why i agree with him when he says that this this idea of creating a signature style is 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 completely not understandable for me i don't understand why why i should do that i i want to surprise myself i want to be able to surprise people around me that's what i feel that i can do and it doesn't mean that people who are able to operate and to be fascinated within a very very narrow you know some people kind of make the same painting all their lives and they find it fascinating i i i admire those people greatly i'm i'm perfectly fine with that i don't have a problem with it but it's very hard for me to do it and that's why i i kind of get pissed off with the art world and they say well pair when are you going to decide what it is that you're doing it's like damn it you know i decided 35 years ago and i'm doing it you know come on give me a break you know it doesn't it doesn't have to be that you can you look at it for half a second and you say oh that's a hacker oh isn't it beautiful yes it's been doing that for 35 years it's incredible oh yeah let's go to the next booth um um and I was reading again Václav Havel. I don't know. I I have to uh, admit that I've never read any of his novels, but I, he's sort of he's come up lately in a couple of times. And I read a text that he um, wrote uh, um, about politics and about power structures. And he said that power structures, when they get too powerful, and I assume he's talking about his experiences being. Um, 
in the former Eastern Europe and, and you know, as part of this sort of in the shadow of, of, of the Soviet in the Eastern Bloc. He said that when they get too much power um, and when they're not questioned, they lose their contact with reality. And again, the word reality is really, really complicated and, and goes there with truth and is one of those words that I'm happy to avoid, but I think we have to talk about. And, and when I read that, I thought about the art world because I feel that the art world is so obsessed with itself. It's become a closed system and it doesn't, doesn't tie back into the world. It doesn't sort of say, well, you know, when I, when I woke up this morning, I really could use that Caravaggio painting in order to figure out how to feed my cat, although I didn't have anything to, you know, to feed it to or whatever. It's just a, a self-perpetuating system where everybody is very happy to, you know, give each other champagne and grants and then, you know, go back. And there's very little uh, ethical fiber if you ask me in that kind of behavior. And there I am, 37 minutes later. Thank you so much, Perry. Gazelle, go ahead. Yeah, I have to say this when it's hot. Thank you, Perry. Thank you. First of all, <laughs> I have to say, in my opinion, uh, you're, now you're doing actually an art, artwork that is not limited to the art world, which is more art if I can say that. For example, um, people who are listening have not seen it, but if I describe the works you did uh, 20 years ago, there was a lot of self-portraits. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> as a video, as photography. Yeah. And for me, I mean, I'm, I, for me, I see this as a self-portrait, but it's like a self-portrait of, the spirit of the inside, you know what I mean? It's a journey to inside. And I, I, I mean, I, it's still art and it's really more interesting as art because maybe the work you did before was limited to the art world, but this is not limited. This is unlimited because this, uh, this not only touches science, but it touches life, it, touches, it goes beyond. This things you can perform anywhere, like you said. Yeah, and you're not a scientist, you're an artist. So, so I think that that's, the, it's really incredible because now it's not limited to the art world. It's limited, it's, it's, uh, it's an art which is much more universal actually. Because, and then in the end, it, it's like, you know, before you did visual self-portraits, now you're doing like a self-portrait of, I don't know, your spirit, your inside. I mean, I mean, the brain, I mean, it's not just the brain. It's also the symbol in a way of the spirit you know I mean the heart too and then okay so one other question these things attached to your head are they on one side or on both sides no they're on uh so basic I don't know how to show this so I have I have two up here yeah um and they I'll I'll show you what uh, yeah but uh, you know because all I mean I don't know much but you know when they said the left brain and the right brain is different is it on your right side now um it's on my yeah it's, it's on my right it's side. on my right side why uh it's yeah. just just chance so this is what they look like and i have a little bit of gel as you can see and and what i i i know this 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 right and left brain thing and and the way that it it crosses over because i do qigong and and in Qigong, it's very important to break these homolateral movements. So I know, I know, um, and I have a wonderful uh, friend and colleague in Denmark. She's probably, she's getting on 90 and she always talks about the, the importance of, I can't remember what the opposite of homolateral, the, the contralateral, I think it was called, movement of the brain. But I don't think I don't I mean, think I don't think that the the rational I can never remember which is which I don't think it matters whether you measure the okay. the rational or the, the the emotional side of the brain I don't think you get a, okay. any um, just one question before uh, everyone starts because before I forget it and then um like is it is is this done only in performances with your audiences or and or 
uh, you also do it like a, like a performance or like the journey into yourself every day. Like, would you, and then do you keep a re record of it? Is it a video in the end? Not to show, but just for you. No, you no, I mean, I, yeah. of your brain. Actually, all the recordings are recorded. So I have, I have endless hours of my own brain, but it's not something that you go back and look at. Um, but it's, I mean, I don't put it on in order to to meditate. If I want to meditate, I, I meditate. I don't I don't need this or I don't want this. And usually when I work with music, I I work with an old recording because it's it's good enough for me to to kind of get a sense of what it is that I'm doing. But to give you an example of how sensitive it is, when I started doing the, the project with the sleep EG. I was working with a, a, a recording from when I was awake and that didn't work at all because it sounded completely different at night. So there's, in, there's when I go from one brain state to another brain state, it changes so much that it, that it gives a big kind of difference in terms of, um, uh, of the actual sound output. Okay, thank you, Efron. Thank you so much, Bear, for your amazing uh, lecture performance. Um, one thing that came to my mind is that, like, um, for all the artists that um, we invited, Gazelle invited, um, it's interesting that they're using all these like different tactics to tackle the ideas, and that's I, I think that's what. Um, the whole idea of like tacticality means like from Kendall using, I don't know, like <clears throat> uh, like wires with blades and stuff with Zina using like cinema with Adrian using photography and you, you're using technology. Um, it's so interesting that they have like all this like variety of artists doing all these different stuff, but they all are considered artists. Uh, my question is that uh, for you specifically, Per Hudner, is that you're sort of combining two different realms that are supposed to be very, they're not, they're not similar at, at all whatsoever. You have the realm of art that deals with, um, I don't know, questioning and uh, not getting to the answer as opposed to science and needs the answer. Uh, and your artwork uh, is in the middle of these two. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know, they, they don't look like friends, but you're making them uh, uh, to be familiar with each other. How do you think uh, how technology, what technology brings to the table for art and what art brings to the table for technology? They can sort of, in a sense, complete each other. Mm. Well, for, first of all, I, I wouldn't say that I, I mean, this is a, is a complete perversion of, of science. I mean, there's, there's no science left in there. It's not, I mean, um, the scientists that we work with, they often kind of want, well, it would be great if we can, you know, get a paper out of this or if we can do, yeah, sure, you know, but I'm, I'm not going to bend over for that. I'm, I'm an artist. I, I make art. I don't. Um, so I would say it's a lot more about the sort of meeting. Um, usually when, when we start working with people from the science field in the beginning, they tend to think that this is an, a, a, an interesting kind of pastime for them. So they do it like, oh, I can do this on weekends and I can have fun and I can go to cool clubs with artists or whatever it is that they wanna do. But gradually, and, and they're, they're usually in the beginning, they're very dismissive of art and they kind of feel like art is, it has no knowledge or does not contribute with anything worthwhile. But, and it takes time, but over time, they, they, they learn how to both to respect us and to see that actually what we're doing contains a lot of knowledge and, and a lot of valuable knowledge. 
and also that they can see that the work that we do together can be used by them. And uh, it's very hard for me to talk about how they implement them. You need, you really need to ask them. You really need to ask them themselves. But I can, I they re, they kind of iterate this oh, time and time again that you know they use it in different ways and and they, they understand things. They know they learn how to see problems from from more angles. They they somehow they learn from us. And of course, we learn from them as well. And, and I think that this is one of the fundamental things that we've learned with Vision Forum is that the, the more different people you can bring into a, to a project and make them function together, the more, the more productive it's going to be for everyone involved. But what you need is, um, is an overlap. You need a question where everyone is engaged in. So with this one, it's about uh, the EEG and sound or EEG and images. So it always goes back to EEG and the performance. In another project that I'm working with now that we're going to present in Helsinki in two weeks time, it's about microbes. So it's about how the microbes in the gut, gut inform our identity, our behavior, how we are and things like that. But it's the same thing. There's there's an overlap. We there's something that we can go back to, and and I and, and I know that it's been a, a wonderful learning experience for for everyone involved. And I I don't really think that technology in itself is is that important. It's 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 about um, the questions that you deal with, that's why I'm trying to bring it back to sort of metaphysical questions. What is it that we need to deal with in, in our everyday life? And, and I do feel that issues about uh, truth, about rhetoric, about uh, how we use science or how science is, can be misused for, the wrong purposes and so on and so forth. So it's difficult to, to deal with these questions, but those are the questions that we need to deal with because it has to inform, it has to help us in our everyday. If it doesn't help us in our everyday, it's, it's, it, it does nothing, if you ask me. Thanks so much, Bear. Arman, um, that's all. One, one question. Um, uh, when you do the performances, when you talk about your audiences, how does that happen? I mean, okay. And then could you also say that, uh, explain a little bit about that COD project and the music making <coughs> and the noise sound. Like for example, when your audiences, when you perform, uh, what happens? Do the audiences, do you choose them? Do they choose, you know what I mean? Can you explain about the performances actually, the live ones? Well, I mean, there's sometimes they're different. I mean, I, uh, the last performance that we did in Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, it was me and my and two musicians and I was basically in the middle and I was dressed up like this and I was basically providing them with a signal to work with. Um, and, and so what happens is that this signal is sent around and then I hear the music that they use, that they make using the signal which changes the signal and, and it becomes this kind of feedback loop where nobody in the end knows who does what. So it becomes a kind of a, uh, a kind of melting pot. I mean, it's, it's very much like an orchestra in the end, you know, you, you really, you become one with, with sounds that you make. But here it's even clearer because I, I influence the, the, the sounds directly that are made and how the sound is, is, is moving in the, in the space. But I also done stuff where I make music and I invite two people from the audience to wear this thing. And then I make music in real time and I show images or, you know, I, I can sometimes give a talk or it's overlapping but it's usually using sound 
and moving images in, in one way or another. That's the way that it's been the, the, the last couple of, of, of years. And the and and the, um, you want to hear is about it recorded? the cardfish? Is it recorded? No, I want you to tell the cardfish too, please. But is it recorded? I mean, it's just live performance, or is it recorded and shown again? Um, we've been pretty bad with with the video documentation. So there's 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 there are descriptions on my website. Um, there's not a lot, a lot of sound because we're creating a new website. Um, there might be some sounds if you go to the EEG Synth website, which is eegsynth.org. Um, but the whole documentation thing with performance where you have to record everything and it's, it's, uh, it's a nightmare. Huh? And I wish that it was the responsibility of the of the uh, um, the organizers to to make some kind of documentation because it's 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 a full job just to be able to make the performance, let alone record it, and then edit the video. But sound recordings we have a lot, and they will appear on uh, relatively soon on. Um, on the on the website and then when you perform the scientists are not there that one plus one equals three we've done equals... we've done lots of of different uh usually um usually the scientists are present but the good thing is as you can see i can do do it now in the beginning we needed them in order to make sure that the that the, the signal had good enough quality. I mean, the, the signal now is shit because I'm touching the computer and I'm talking and all of this is giving feedback. But if, if I were to sit down and, and focus, we'd get a nice, nice signal. So I know how to do it and thereby we, we're not dependent on them the way that we were before. But for instance, with when we start a new project, so the one with the COD, for instance, it started with uh, a friend of mine in Norway. He was talking about them, this project that they're doing where um, they're recording codfish uh, when they're mating. And the codfish are making specific sounds when they mate by the male's hit has, they have a special muscle on the inside where they hit the, the swim bladder, which is this kind of airbag that goes along the, the spine. And so they hit that in a specific way that supposedly makes the female cod go, ooh, so sexy. And then they, <clears throat> and then they release their eggs and so the, the guys can go and, and leave you know, their, their contribution. Um, and they, they were talking about how they record, uh, how they use uh, sound equipment to record uh, not only the sounds that they're making, but also their, where they're located in the pond, because the, the, the codfish are in the pond for six months, I think. Um, and uh, I was talking to one of our neuroscientists and he said, this is really interesting because it's quite similar how we try to locate stuff in the brain. So I got them to talk to each other, the neuroscientist and then the the, the fish researcher in Norway, and they were, oh, they were exchanging uh, information. And then we got started talking and then we say, okay, let's make a performance at the pond so that we can play back the sounds to the cod, um, which has been influenced by a human brain. And then we can take the cod sounds and play them back to the audience the human audience, which around the, which is around the pond, which is informed about where the location of the fish is at that moment. So it's a it's a kind of an interspecies kind of dialogue, and we're also supposed to do this at um at the Marine Biological Museum in Bergen, where they have live cod, so we can play the sounds back to see if if the ladies take off their knickers. Sorry for not being politically correct.
You should see cod knickers. They're amazing. Huh? They're so beautiful. Huh? They're like. So, okay, so, so, so it's, it's very much about bringing people together. It's like we find this, this common ground and then we bring people together. And, and usually we have incredible conversations and they talk about what they do and, and we talk about what we do and gradually we build up trust. And so the good thing with this Dutch neuroscientist is that he, I can, I can probably propose virtually anything and he'll be like, yeah, sure, I trust Pear, let's go and do it, you know? Which was not the case in the beginning. He was incredibly suspicious and rightly so, huh? you know? He, who would trust a, a grown man who, tr who climbs trees wearing wedding dresses, you know? Maybe you should say you should explain that the wedding dress because no, it was it was because, that's no, how because I met that was Giselle. the first self portrait. That was the first self portrait. Now you're getting to yeah, the spiritual. So that's, that's how I that's how I met uh, Giselle. I was showing a picture of uh, of myself wearing a, a wedding dress. So that's that's kind of how we knew each other. First knew each other twenty years ago. No, it was like two thousand one or something like that. I think. So that's an, an internal joke. The French love this deuxième degree, troisième degree, quatrième degree, and so on and so forth. Right. Can I okay. say something? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Per. Um, this is all new to me. Um, <laughs> It's all new to me as well. <laughs> but as I was listening to you, um, kind of abstract thoughts were coming to my mind. And I was linking things with each other. And I was struck by a number of things you said um, about um, art. What does it do for us? And um, your performances um, are a kind of very ephemeral, eph ephemeral in nature. You don't document them, the performances that, you know, uh, unless you were there, you don't know what went on. Um, and these are fundamentally um, created um, through a technique that is using your the signals that you're generating and those signals are um, very much dependent on your present state and your activity and when you were talking about that feedback loop um, that that sometimes you hear the, the output and it affects the input and so on. Um, this, this um, and I was thinking um, that, that here, the agency of the artist is quite important, I think. Um, although a lot of it is still process-based. Um, it is the agency of the artist and all the tools at their disposal, including the audience that is participating in this. Um, and I was thinking suddenly, a, a thought came to my mind that, that, that what is the link between this art form and abstract expressionism uh, because there is something there probably um, there's a record of it you know because we have an output that isn't uh, uh, quite quite as uh, ephemeral as, as 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 yours but um this is this is 
as I said, you know, 45 minutes is, is too early for me to, to form an opinion. But what came to mind was really, um, I, I, I'm beginning to appreciate that there is a deeper um, thing to this than this 45 minutes that I listened. And, and probably your practice over the past 20, 25 years is, 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 is the result of that. Um, thank you. Um, for <laughs> opening my mind to some really um, deep thoughts that, that, that I need to um, spend more time on, I think, you know. That's, that's, beautiful. that's my... I, the, the, only, the only thing I can say is that I, I don't find it difficult for me to draw a straight line between what I'm doing and Jackson Pollock. I think that um, I don't think that Jackson Pollock, as he was sort of getting drunk and spilling his paint, he was thinking. I I think that in eighty five years, a Swedish guy will do <laughs> do sound with his brain. But but I think that there's I think that there's something there. I mean, we're we're all we're all trying, you know, we're all grappling with with what we have, and we're trying to do something with with the tools that we have at hand and i and i guess that's also what Erfan was getting at before you know we're 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 trying to work with the tools that we have and once once we realize that the toolbox maybe is bigger than because that i think that's i think that that is when we're limited by 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 the thought of our toolbox of course our life will be limited so if we think that art <clears throat> has to be um, paint on canvas, then so so be it. But but once we can open, and it's the same thing with all culture. I mean, you know, we when we read anthropology and the way that um, the way that people in, people in Amazonas and how they live and how they the values that they have were outraged but I mean they're equally outraged with how we see the world and 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 it's only for me anthropology is incredibly important because it it allows me to understand how incredibly narrow my perspective is on the world not because because I'm stupid or not because I'm, but because of the language that I use because of the the culture that I grow up with. And there's this, uh, all these beautiful examples of, of you know, the, uh, the, um, the Native Americans in, in Northern Amer America who's, who have verb-based languages. They can go for days and have conversations without using a single noun. And they keep saying, you'll never understand what we're talking about because you're only, you're obsessing with these objects. It's like objects are not important. It's all about process. So it doesn't matter how process-based become with in 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 when we when we deal with them and their way of their ontology, we're we're incredibly different. But I think I think life becomes richer when you when you open yourself and sort of say, well, hey. I can I can never live a life where I have a, a verb based language, but let me at least try and think what does it mean? Mm. Yeah, great. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and thank you for, for Jackson Pollock. I really uh, well, no, you said abstract expression. Well, it was Jackson Pollock was really at the back of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> But he is the father of performance, all performance art, isn't he? Um, also, um, a little bit of Eve Klein as well, perhaps, you know, um, using um, not necessarily naked persons to, um, to, to, to drag them on, on the canvas, but, but, you know, your audiences are probably um, different. And he's a, he's a big hero. I've, he's done a lot of really interesting work.
But the interesting thing is when you go and see the work, it's it's quite boring actually. It's the it's the beauty of the ideas. <laughs> Sorry, I, I might just go away. I have to just say before others ask their questions. That's why you go beyond the bubble. I mean, the art world, you said, it's the bubble. And you're not in objects anymore. And you not, not only you go beyond it, but you touch many other stuff. And I mean, you with this can touch much more audiences that would never go to museums and galleries and see art. You know what I mean? And that's the, the beautiful thing about it. It's much more universal and much more much more accessible. From a little kid to a scientist, you know, you, your your range is much wider, and I think it's great. Voila! Now, yeah, I had a, I had a wonderful experience. We we did a project at, uh, or I did a project at the Noble Museum, and for the opening, we had we tr so there were eight uh, kind of suitcases uh, that were. Um, devoted to eight Nobel laureates. And there were a bunch of uh, old museum people from Germany who got the um, Heisenberg kit. And they said, this is way too advanced for, uh, for the audience. And I say, yeah, I, I, I do my best. And then my cousin's son, who was eight at the time, he came and he did it and he did it beautifully without any problems at all. So, ask their question because your cousin's kid had more imagination. Some people lose their imagination when they get older. Yeah, yeah totally. Also, uh, building uh, on top of what Arma said about your relation, the relation between what you're doing and Jackson Pollock because they both come from like the, your this subjectivity. I really like yours way more than Pollock. Sorry? I like yours more than Pollock's because <laughs> first Thank of you. all, it's it's not that easily commodified. And second of all, they, it's a reliable data instead of superficial <laughs> like color in pain. And the, which is basically a Rorschach test or just a <laughs> stimulus of what you think is what I'm painting like this is not this is reliable data that you can actually <laughs> talk about so these are the two reasons that i like you way more than jackson pollock which i think that's a just a fraud in you know well i want to unleash on jackson pollock right now if if anybody else has uh any questions from the audience thank you so much <laughs> Hazel, Arman, anybody? No, I um, I can go on for a long time. I am. Another thing, um, you know, I, like when you say that you re you've got uh, loads of recordings of your brain and everything. Okay, I wonder how it enters your life. I will refer to myself and those films you saw. You know that we're one day going to show together. Yeah. Um, you know, at one point they were so upset. I was so obsessed with that. I was just doing, doing. I mean, I was like making, uh, I don't know, 70, 80, 90 scenes per year. I mean, it was really crazy. Now it's like five only because it's 20 something years later. And, you know, somehow, and then sometimes you think that your the work is more important than your life, you know? So I was wondering with your work, I mean, when you do something which is so obsessive, you know, like I'm constantly filming myself doing different performances and it just and it was so easy because it was like my camera me and my tripod so it was really easy so you also have your equipment and I was wondering how obsessed you are with this or are you less obsessed than I mean do you do this every day or do you do it during do you sleep with these things on <laughs> well when I do sleep EEG I, I, I sleep with it um no I think that the 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 kind of the, the time spent organizing things with Vision Forum takes too much time, but I, I try to do it as often as I can um, to work with this in one way or another. But it's it's hard, I think, to 
<clears throat> to find the time to, to really work with art. There's uh, so much pressure to do all these pointless things and, you know, um, being on Instagram and, I don't know, filling out tax forms or whatever it is that we do all our days. Um, so I, I wish that I were more obsessed with it and that I had more time focusing on, on, the, on, the, on the artistic side of things. But I, but I think this is also, I mean, it's, it's hard to explain without sort of having an idea about how Vision Forum works, but it's because it's, it's also collective. It's, it's also the boundaries are, are really, really, uh, it's hard to, to draw a boundary between uh, artistic, organi organizational, curational, uh, educational, all these things kind of collapse into to one, one thing. Um, and sort of philosophically, it, it becomes easier to see the, see the connections between things and, and maybe even to a certain degree um, formulating them. But it's also, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I feel that it's, it's hard. I feel like I'm harder and harder on myself every, every year, <laughs> which is probably a good thing, but um, um, I don't wanna, I don't wanna leave anything half, half done, which I think before I'd be happy, I was happy to do. Uh, can I ask something else? Um, Pat, you. I think you need to your turn work the is, camera. Um, I, I I don't hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. Um, the the work is mostly um, using sound. Um, have you considered what can be done turning the signals into lights? But but I'm thinking about these new LEDs that, that change color. Um, we've used, we used uh, DMX lights, we've used uh, uh, LED lights, we've used moving images. Um, we used quite a lot, but we've, re I think I, I made one sculpture where it was just the, the signal and, and the light with the sculpture, but most of the time, it is using sound because sound and image or sound and light go very well together. But there's, um, I've started working with animations and I, I would like to take that further when I have time to kind of see how I can work with animations and also automate, uh, I don't know whether they have to be abstract images using this and it's something that we're talking about in in the kind of collective how we can do that great great i look forward to that thanks thank you all right um Yazel, do you have any other questions no 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 i'm fine all right um, oh do you what? know how bono bono is there do i know oh Oh, oh, Pono Pono. It's no. a Hawaiian shamanism thing. No. I think <laughs> you could do something. I think it would interest you. I'll, I'll tell you later on about it. I'm really into shamanism. So as you can see. Yeah. Yeah. That's why. And I think it has some, you know, when you were talking about the day you wake up and you say fuck and the day you wake up and say <laughs> love, whatever. That's Ho'oponopono. Yes, okay. I'll tell you about it. Right. All right. It's Hawaiian feminism. Cool. Okay, should we wrap it up? Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Per uh, Hotner. <coughs> thank you for an amazing talk. Thanks for being with us. Thank, thank you for your 
amazing uh, lecture and lecture performance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks a lot, sir. Bye. Thank Hope so to much. see more Have of this. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.